Okay. So up next is Jessica, Jessica Horning. She's the pedestrian and bicycle program manager. And while she's getting set here, just want to, <clears throat> excuse me, let people know that she bought, brought her bag of tricks. She brought some things that are right here on the table. So if you want to get something once we have concluded, um, please do so. Yes, sir. I just want to add one more piece to that last question. Uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation, we're a multimodal agency. And so it's not just about highways, but it's also about transit, rail, bike, pad, and, and uh, trucking. And so as we come up with designs, one of the uh, strengths of ODOT is that collaboration with our communities and our stakeholders. And so a lot of the presentations that you're hearing about, it's like, why does this apply to me? Well, case in point with mobility, we know that mobility and trucking is, is uh, benefiting commerce and economy for Oregon. Bike pet is another element here where as we have our projects, if there's like, opportunities to improve or accommodate, we certainly want to have those conversations so that we end up with a product or a, a transportation system that serves all of Oregon. So that gets to part of your question of, you can always follow a design standard. However, if there's opportunities to enhance, improve, or accommodate, we certainly want to be open to, to those conversations. All right, Jessica, go ahead. All right. Um, well, I think this is kind of a good segue from the Q&A for mobility into active transportation. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You guys have had, this is day two. End of day two. If anybody needs to get up and stretch or move around during this presentation, this is the active transportation section, so feel free to do so. Uh, my name is Jessica Horning. I'm ODOT's pedestrian and bicycle program manager stationed here in uh, the Mill Creek building in Salem. And today I'm gonna share with you a little bit about our pedestrian and bicycle program give you a few challenges related to incorporating active transportation into your projects and some resources to help you address and meet those challenges. But before we get going, just to make sure we're all on the same page with vocabulary, when we talk about active transportation or when we're talking about safety, a lot of times we'll use the word vulnerable users. What we're talking about is hum people using human-powered transportation. So that's people walking, rolling, biking, skating, scooting, accessing transit. And it's not just the Spanditos going up and down the Oregon Coast bike route, which we advertise and manage. It's including people of all ages and abilities, from the kiddos that we're serving through our Safe Routes to School programs with infrastructure improvements and education programs, to older uh, folks and folks with disabilities who we are seeing at huge numbers adopt e-bikes and e-trikes uh, as a growing customer base for active transportation improvements. And we're even seeing DMV uh, issuing mobility device permits for some of these uh, tandem and more newer models of active mobility uh, in the state of Oregon. So why should you care about active transportation? Well, like David said, it is central to our mission as an agency of creating a safe and reliable transportation system and it also is key to us implementing some of our core values, uh, particularly safety and equity as an agency. And just so you know, when we're making improvements for active transportation as part of your, the projects you're managing, we're not just making improvements for this small special interest group. We know from the research that when we make improvements for vulnerable users, that we see improvements for all of our customers and roadway users. So when we make investments in pedestrian safety and come back and study that area, we see improvements in motor vehicle safety. When we design accessible pedestrian facilities along our highway, it makes the system more accessible and improves mobility for everybody using our facilities, including folks who still need to drive to where they need to go. So again, related to that safety and equity core value, I wanted to give you all your first challenge that is when we're going through our uh, PMTs and project development process, we talk about safety a lot. And 
I want to challenge you all when that comes up in your PMT conversations to take a second and ask yourself the question, safety for whom? Or safety for who, because the voice inside my head doesn't really have that great a grammar and English language skills. Um, because while we've seen motor vehicle occupant fatalities really gradually decrease over the years, we are near a 30-year high for vulnerable user fatalities. Uh, motor vehicle occupant deaths have decreased 6% over the last 10 years, while pedestrian fatalities have increased 35%. And uh, vulnerable users are overrepresented in our fatal crashes compared to the percentage of trips, and they're particularly overrepresented on the types of facilities that ODOT tends to be designing and operating. Uh, arterials and higher account for 60 one per 60% of our vulnerable user deaths while they're only 10% of our roadway miles. So we have the ability to make a really big impact on this trend as we're designing and delivering projects at ODOT. Um, and that inequity gets even stronger when you look at intersections with all other vulnerable demographics like age, race, and income. So. Again, when you're working on a project and you're thinking about adding a turn lane to improve safety and reduce rear end crashes for one element of our customer base, I just want you to take that moment to ask safety for whom and think how is this also gonna impact safety for the people crossing the street in this area and that greater exposure it might uh, give them. And how are you going to balance and prioritize safety for all of our different customers that we serve at ODOT? Exercise challenge number two. Raise your hand if you know your region's active transportation liaison. Awesome. If you did not raise your hand, as soon as you get done with this workshop tonight or at the end of the week, I want you to make a point of inviting your ATL out for coffee, wandering by their cubicle and saying hi, because these folks are your one-stop shop resource for all of your questions about active transportation and your hookup for resources. I promise they will make your lives easier more and projects easier more frequently than they make them more difficult. And it's a good thing that these are our active transportation liaisons because they are going to be running this racetrack with all of you pretty much from beginning to end. Uh, from identifying preservation and update needs, your ATLs are generally serving on the tack for planning efforts in your region. They're getting user requests. They uh, are your access to the active transportation needs inventory, which is a pedestrian and bicycle management system that we're developing for the state, kind of similar to the SPIS, to tell us where our needs are on our system and how they rank relative to each other in order of priority. Once you get into program development, your ATLs are generally gonna be participating on your scoping teams. Uh, helping to identify leverage opportunities and the funding to pay for all those opportunities that you're identifying through scoping, and making, helping you make sure that your project is meeting the requirements of the bike bill, which is something we'll talk about a little bit more in just a second. Once you get into project development, ATLs are generally going to participate on your PMT if you've got any sort of pedestrian and bicycle impacts on your project. And they will be helping you review plans, engage stakeholders. The ATLs are really ODOT's public face when it comes to interacting with community groups and those uh, advocacy groups that you may have in your community. And in this phase, the ATLs are also going to be a great resource going forward as the blueprint for urban design, which I'll talk a, touch on in just a second, is rolling out in December. And that new piece of ODOT design guidance has a new bicycle facility selection process and pedestrian crossing spacing guidance in addition to some other updates to the highway design manual. 
Once you get to the construction phase, there's not quite as much that the ped bike program and uh, active the ATLs get involved in unless we are providing funding for your project. If you have a really high traffic area, that uh, high pedestrian and bicycle traffic area, you might have your ATL attend your pre-con uh, just to help share the specific issues and concerns with your contractor. And the ATLs are frequently going to be the people that are getting complaints or comments about how your work zone traffic control and your TPAR is, is working out and if it's being set up and functioning the way that you intended it to. So they'll pa be passing that sort of feedback along to you. So I mentioned the bike bill. Uh, ORS 366514, because everybody's got their, their statute, probably in this uh, series of presentations you've been getting. So uh, this is commonly known as the Oregon Pedestrian and Bicycle Bill, or just Bike Bill, even though it does also uh, apply to pedestrians. This was passed in 1971 and was championed by Don Stathos, a Republican from Jacksonville. I always just think that that's an interesting bit of trivia related to this legislation. But it has two main components. The first is that any recipient of state highway funds in the state of Oregon, ODOT, city, county, anyone, needs to spend a minimum of 1% of those funds on pedestrian and bicycle improvements each fiscal year. So for TPMs, this is not really something you need to pay much attention to because it's not a project by project requirement. It is an agency overall annual measure that my office that runs the numbers and makes sure we're meeting that requirement every year. What you do need to be aware of as a, as a TPM or anyone in project delivery planning is the second requirement, which is that walkways and bikeways must be provided anytime any public roadway is constructed, reconstructed, or relocated in the state. So, that means any 4R project is triggering this requirement and some 3R and single function projects. Generally, a good rule of thumb to know if you're triggering this requirement or not is if you're doing full depth work or if you're doing anything where you're moving a curb line or widening your roadway. You are likely doing something that DOJ would consider reconstruction with your project. And there are only three exceptions in the statute to this requirement to provide walkways and bikeways. Uh, they're really reasonable, but there are no cases where an agency has made an exception it has been and it's been challenged in court where the court has upheld that exception. So the bar is pretty high to date on uh, meeting this requirement with our projects. The main example that we have to look to is in 1995, the Bicycle Transportation Alliance sued the city of Portland, and ODOT was named in that suit as well because we provided the funding for a project in the Rose Quarter in Portland that uh, was not providing bicycle facilities. The city said, well, we're spending more than 1% of our funding on ped bike improvements with this project, and there's a road a couple blocks over that has a bike lane, so we're good. Court said no. First of all, these are two different requirements. We don't care how much money you're spending on pedestrian and bicycle improvements with this project, and just because you have a bike facility a couple blocks over does not necessarily indicate that there is an absence of need for a bike facility on the street that you're reconstructing. So, uh, moral of the story, if you are working on a project that doesn't include pedestrian and bicycle facilities or a project that when you're scoping it includes something that could be reconstruction or you've got a scope change that could add something to your scope of work that could be considered reconstruction, get in touch with me or with your ATL ASAP. Uh, we have a flow chart and some guidance that are on our website and they should be in your packet of just 
a general uh, process for how to navigate and get an idea if you're triggering bike bill and uh, how to make sure you're meeting requirements. So those are the two take homes if you get nothing else out of this, your ATL and bike bill that I want you to head home with. But some additional resources uh, when you're scoping projects, dealing with bike bill, just dealing with pedestrian and bicycle issues on your projects, TransGIS is a great resource. How many folks already use TransGIS? Okay, great. Uh, there is a roadside layer that includes our existing inventory of sidewalks and bicycle facilities, their width, their condition, and a layer showing project needs for scoping. We also have the Active Transportation Needs Inventory, which I mentioned briefly. We're developing statewide as a pedestrian and bicycle management system. Uh, similar to the SPIS of what is the relative priority of this segment of highway relative to other segments of highway for pedestrian and bicycle investment. You can ask your active transportation liaison for information on that until we get that work completed and up and running on a system so it's available online. Our pedestrian and bicycle plan was adopted in 2016. This is our policy framework and investment priorities for active transportation in the state as part of the OTP. The pedestrian and bicycle design guide is appendix 11 of the highway design manual. That is the technical portion of the state pedestrian and bicycle plan. Includes lots of great guidance, best practices, the practices to be avoided for both state highways and local facilities. And then chapter 13 of the Highway Design Manual is also a really great resource that provides the minimum design standards for pedestrian and bicycle facilities on state highways. And I should say those are the current minimum design standards because as I mentioned, in December, the Blueprint for Urban Design is gonna be rolling out, which has some changes to those tables in chapter 13 of the HDM and a new process for selecting what the appropriate pedestrian, appropriate bicycle facility is for your project. Is it a shared lane, a bike lane, a buffered bike lane, something more separated, and uh, pedestrian spacing guidance. So look forward to some trainings on that. And generally, where the blueprint of, for urban design is taking us is from the highway design manual really starts us with the minimum design standard for that smaller, very strong and fearless design user. And blueprint for urban design is pushing us towards that more separated, more comfortable facility design as a starting point that we know is what serves a larger base of our customers. Real quick example, uh, third challenge, just an exercise that I would like for all of you to go through every time you are scoping a project or you have a set of plans put in front of you. I can guarantee it will make you a better multimodal planner with nothing more than three different colored highlighters. First, just take your plan set. Highlight your pedestrian path through your project area. If you do not know where to place your highlighter on your plan set and you are in an urban area, or you cannot draw a line across your plan set with that highlighter, you may have a problem. You definitely have a problem. And we should talk about scoping and funding for some other improvements to add to your project. Next, do the same thing with a different color for the route people would take on bike through your project area. Find your bus stops and your major origin destinations in your project area. Is it a relatively straight line that people can take from origin to destination? If not, because people move like water, look for the goat paths in your project area and the crash patterns that you're seeing in your crash report that show you the ways that people are actually taking to get from point A to point B, and let's see if we can find a way to formalize those and make those safer so um, we're serving those desire lines and addressing some of those crash patterns. Uh, next, just do the same thing for vehicles. And 
circle every one of those places on your plan set the different colored lines cross each other. And take some time to think about, can I eliminate any of these conflict points with protected phasing, with some reconfiguration of my lanes? Or if you can't eliminate them, can you reduce the speed differential between those different users at those conflict points so that if something happens, it's less likely to result in an injury? And that could be through curb extensions, through co with coordination with our folks at Mobility, um, or any number of other strategies. So at this point, you're saying, OK, I identified a lot of things, and what am I going to do? How are you going to help me fund them? There is hope. There are a lot of different funding programs that pedestrian and bicycle improvements are eligible for. The ones in green are ones are programs that are managed out of my office and are primarily for pedestrian and bicycle improvements on or along state highways. Just the message I want you to get out of this is talk to your ATL. Please don't have an ops project where you've identified an opportunity to improve pedestrian and bicycle conditions and say, oh, it's an ops project, I can't, or it's a paving project, can't do it, wrong color money. Come, come talk to the ATLs, talk to me, and let's see if there's an opportunity we can identify there. Finally, since 15, 20 minutes is nowhere near enough time to talk about planning, design, and funding for multiple modes of transportation, we are setting up a uh, a two-day training in iLearn. It should be available for you all to sign up for next week. So it's we're shooting from March 10th to 11th in Salem for our first training with the structure of day one, a in-classroom pedestrian bicycle planning design overview, including kind of a deep dive in some of that blueprint for urban design guidance on pedestrian and bicycle facilities I mentioned, and a second day of in the field experiential work looking at and experiencing how some of these different designs feel and operate and coming back, uh, we'll probably do some accessibility experiential training as well, then coming back and doing a debrief before we send you back to your regions as uh, newly trained up active transportation experts. So that. Questions for Jessica? Yeah. Mm. Okay, people raised their hands and then looked away, so I didn't know. <laughs> I noticed that on your local um, programs, the local bridge program wasn't listed. How do local <gasps> bridges interface with your program? So if we have a, a bridge and it's through the local bridge program, do we have to take into consideration bike facilities on it, if they've widened it a little? Um, that is a good question. So with, in terms of how bike bill applies to a local bridge project, it, it applies equally to ODOT, ODOT, city, county, any public roadway. So if you were doing something that was considered reconstruction on that bridge, like you're widening it, it, it would apply there. Um, I, I want to ask a question related to especially pedestrian and hazard situation at night. And I want to know if there are uh, potentially finance available for lighting, especially on the mid-block crossings. Yeah, um, so at intersections and wherever we are Implementing mid-block crossings, we should be as part of that design putting in spot illumination that works for the roadway and for particularly at the mid-block crossing. If we have an existing mid-block crossing that doesn't have adequate lighting, we definitely want to work with our traffic folks to evaluate that and see what improvements we can make. And that's something that's eligible for funding uh, through multiple different sources. When it comes to the linear corridor pedestrian scale lighting, that is really kind of a tough one. We can fund it, but really need to coordinate with our local partners and with maintenance to make sure that we've got the agreements and the structure set up to have someone pay that electrical bill and 
be there to maintain those luminaires long term because um, the pedestrian bicycle program can't foot that long term maintenance bill. Yeah. I, I have a question. So, oh, um, sorry, you're, you're calling on people. What am I doing? <laughs> well, we're doing, we're both sides. Yeah. <laughs> Um, would you recommend a uh, walk audit or bike audit early in project development? I would definitely recommend <laughs> that. Uh, so ATLs are generally participating in, in scoping and would, I think it's really helpful when you're doing that scoping process, when if you get out of the van and walk through your project area and if you have folks who are comfortable with it, to bike through your project area as well. It really gives you a different perspective. Um, and in planning processes, I really recommend doing walking and biking audits as part of that to really identify those needs early on. Um, and there's some really good tools out there too for how to set up a walking and biking audit that are checklists that I'd be happy to connect folks with if that's something they wanna do. I have a mic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just wonder um, how much work we're doing before a lot of these crosswalk uh, projects are programmed. Because uh, I was I was um, uh, disappointed on a project that I had to propose three. We ended up with one, and um, I'm not sure if there was. Uh, a lot of planning that went into the locations of those because the city absolutely objected to it and it, it really uh, was unfortunate. But the, the good news is, is we were able to deliver one. So um, I just, because of the nature of those uh, mid-block crosswalks uh, with RFBs that everybody loves and some people don't, um, I just, it seems like we could do a better job of finding out where those are needed uh, so that when we go to deliver the project that we've already had the buy-in. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, um, and the other part of it is transferring the maintenance um, of those over to the locals, is that appropriate when it's on a state highway? And I think, I think um, there's some work to be done there. I, I just don't know how um, to improve it um, and I, I'm just thinking out loud here that it seems like we could get a little bit closer to what would be agreed upon um, before we go to program uh, such projects. And I don't know if you would concur or if you have an opposite opinion, but I'm just interested in your view, actually. Yeah, I think that's uh, cr planning and placement for crossings, I think, is a common frustration. and is something that has historically kind of lived in this gap between planning and project development. Of We would really like TSPs to identify all the desired crossing locations, so we know those early on, but uh, when we're working through all the, the technical requirements that we've had to make sure that we've got the crossing in a, the right place, know the appropriate uh, type of design treatment and everything, that ends up being beyond the scope of the planning process. So uh, we are identifying some funds to be able to kind of fill that gap and uh, go in and work with our tech centers to be able to do that analysis and get those crossings more, more shovel ready before we have them for funding. Um, but that's still a work in process. I think similar to a lot of other programs, our crossings also got kind of caught up in changes in ADA standards and what were really quick hit small projects, the, the cost really ballooned on them in the last couple of years. So we have some of these bundles where we were hoping to go through and do three or five crossings with arts and we're, we're able to do a, a couple at the end of the day and maybe we can identify some SWIP funding to implement those other ones or um, yeah, just have them ready to go for the next round of funding. All right. yeah. um, can, you, can you talk to the piecemeal nature of trying to improve um, either suburban or 
semi-rural facilities where you might have a, a tiny reconstruction here and a tiny reconstruction there. How do you manage that and what are your expectations and what does the bike bill drive for getting you to the ultimate end result? Um, unfortunately, I don't know that the bike bill provides us much, much guidance there. It's not the most de lengthy or detailed of pieces of statute. Um, it just says, you're doing this, you got to do this. Uh, so we are really kind of a, a scrappy program for pedestrian and bicycle active transportation and try to piecemeal things in where we can get it based on the funding we have available. And so we'll coordinate with, uh, with development review to be able to get frontage improvements where we can or if it's part of a longer term vision for a whole corridor transformation, at least preserve the right of way for that future investment. Um, so definitely there's a role for the program there. I, we'd, I'd really love for there to be more corridor plans with that corridor vision, particularly for ODOT facilities, because sometimes those tend to live in the place where locals are doing a planning process at TSP and they do a really great job of addressing their streets and their local network, but step back when it comes to the ODOT facilities because that ownership tension and not wanting to say they want something that we're not okay with and yeah. So. Great, Jessica, thank you so much. Great presentation, great information.